this, 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 this cannibalistic you know, <laughs> instincts. It's, it's, it's animals, you know, it's, it's like cats having sex, you can hear it all night. So this is like the same energy at work. So how do you make a child? But there's a nice letter Prabhupada the comments. He says, I never made a secret that Brahmachari is the best uh, position to progress in spiritual life. He, he writes the Grihastha. <laughs> but, you know, your plans to get married and this, they are fully blessed by me and my blessings, and go ahead. Now, you know, in 1977, I could read you something from Prabhupada. He said about Grihastha's two months before he died. It was not very pleasant. He was highly, highly dissatisfied with the state of things in Iskon amongst the Hastas. Highly dissatisfied. Because he did such a sacrifice. I mean, you know, his God is well laughing about him. Swamiji went to the West and became a marriage maker. Ah. Because from a Vedic point of view, Sanyas is arranging marriages and please marry him and please marry that. And, and even making his fire sacrifice, you know, he is swaha, you know, and be blessed. It's absurd. But entering such a devastated, spiritually devastated field, Prabhupada had to start somewhere, something. Because we are, from spiritual point of view, or from very point of view, we are not even humans. So he had to first put it in a human context, in a human form. From there on we can actually have some spiritual life. So, Prabhupada, from zero, really from scratch, actually not from zero, from minus, he started to build up First he brought us to the point of zero and then start to add spiritual life. So uh, we have a long way to go. But uh, huh? what really made the difference then between the very early days when the Grihastas were very successful in their preaching and faith. then later faith. Faith. But that faith deteriorated or huh? because yeah. later the, that yeah, same, it is same we have so much Mahavada influence, we have so much relativism, we have so much equalit equalitarianism, you know, we are all the same. You know. It is all tearing down the faith. There is no supreme, we are all the same. There is no higher and lower, we are all the same. And it is all taking different shapes and forms, and this is tearing apart the faith. These devotees, they really had faith. Prabhupada writes, it will be all right. So then if I'm in the letters, you say, Chen Krishna, it will be all right. So then Prabhupada said, it's all right, it will be all right. Finished. They were preaching from garages. They didn't have any temples, nothing. There was no sadhana. There was nothing of this what we have today. If you know how the England Yatra started, I mean, this was with the help of the hell's angels. Shama Sundar was always had his contacts, you know, you know, you know and all this. And, but the real thing is that there were 24 hours a day something how to please Prabhupada, how to please Prabhupada, and how to meet somebody, just to meet somebody. There are few words in this movement last time, in this mood. However eccentric he may be, but my God, Vada Prithu Prabhu is an ideal example of that. He will go in Denver's, uh, you know, on Metro, he will come back with a bhakta. Maybe a strange bhakta, I don't know what kind of bhakta, but, uh, you know, but he will pick somebody. And probably he will shave him at the same night. <laughs> I don't know. But you know, that's, we can discuss that. <laughs> I'm not exactly on the same line. But you know, but the mood, the spirit was there. You just put a tilak on, you shave, put a dory, go in the street and get somebody. You know, this was the whole heaven that he carried around. Hey, come here, come here. You don't expect people approaching you and asking what are you doing, you go to them. You are imposing yourself on people all the time. Because you have nothing to hide. You have nothing to hold. You have nothing. You are, you are finished. You have only to give. So there is also very de great deteriorated this giving mood. Serving mood. It's all, you know, okay, I will serve this mood, but this is for me, you know. This is mine. This is for me. This reservation. You know. Hear it everywhere. Security, security. I'm the living example of this. I'm 40 years dangling around. Where's my security? Nothing. 
If you tomorrow have a meeting and tell him you don't want Maridana, he has too much, he's old guy, he, you know, he's always talking some, uh, some disturbing stuff and get him on the street and I go. It's it. But I have an absolute hundred percent faith that to the end of my life, Prabhupada and Krishna will take care of me. Because I experienced this already. I walked around with some money in a pocket. I walked around with no money in a pocket. I was working in a structure which looked like it will last forever. This structure is gone. It's finished, it's destroyed. Institution is broken, I should be a very frustrated person. No, you'll be amazed, I'm totally optimism. Because I know, to my last breath, you know, even with all my conditioning and all my stupidity, Prabhupada will take care. He always did. Exactly on that point, I was thinking, you don't know if you have experienced that feeling, but when you have a family around, it can come easily. You suddenly get this, okay, how are we going to survive the next month? Okay, oh, suddenly kind of doesn't make sense, right? Mm. Logically spoken, should be bad, I should be desperate. And exactly at that moment, somebody comes into your life and says, hey, come here, why don't you do this, and I can help you like that, and we can preach like this, and then you stay in the preaching field. There is so much shelter in the preaching field. And then you move into this Kama Mishra, you know, this Kanishta field. There is so much anxiety, you know. Who is going to pay for this? How will I survive? How are we going to eat? Isn't it all people who always hear the same song? This hankering and this... I had a grandmother like this, you know. She was always like, oh no, oh no. And exactly that mentality brought her into de des 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 despair and possibly bankruptcy. Eventually there was no bankruptcy. But it's, it's, like, a, it's like a karmic dictated torment. This hankering thing, you know, this paranoia. This should not exist in the world. And that's what this devotee said. And it's not also like they were young and naive or, or healthy or... They were not healthy. You read Prabhupada's letters, quite some devotees who are going invalid, getting sick. Yesterday I read a wonderful lady on the devotee writes to Prabhupada. Actually, it's Rupanuka. He was in Vaisha, good in money making. But he absorbed the, the concept of Prabhupada, I will make money, yes. He was like, and Prabhupada was, you know, he knew how to make money. So whoever had this righteous spirit, Prabhupada being quite encouraging. Good profit. You have to make a good profit. Yes, yes, yes. That's my chateau for Krishna. But somehow the Rupanoga concluded that uh, whatever I make must go to Krishna. Nothing for me. Nothing. Prabhupada said it's a very noble feeling. But regarding your letter, that you actually approach your mother to pay for the dentist for fix your teeth, you don't have to do that. You are entitled to take Krishna's money and fix your teeth because your whole body is engaged in Krishna's service. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but you can see how this was uh, thinking. But the Prabhupada writes in the same way, but nevertheless, if your mother actually contributes in this way, then she will be also involved in devotional service, so there is no harm to ask her, you know. But please be assured that you are not basically what Prabhupada is telling him. You are not stealing anything. This is your right to take this. I grew up like this, you know, nothing for me. I couldn't go on Sangitam by myself, she was absolutely forbidden. That's a sinful activity. But you can go out and back. That you can do as a mom. So I was going shoe shop to shoe shop, you know, and please, you have some old shoes you couldn't sell. I remember that. Can you give me, please, some shoes? You know, because I had no shoes to go on Sangeta. And, uh, you know, monk coming in a shop. It's a bit strange. It never happened probably before. They were like completely confused. And, what? You know, I, I'm not the boss. Can I speak to the boss, please? Can you give me some shoes? You know, like this. I mean, I was like that. We are all like that. I can tell you the story of John Sangita. It's full of the stories. And then finally, I mean, some cynical woman told me, yeah, yeah, you can take this shoe. Now I have a shoe size which is not so easy to find, you know. It's all 45, it starts to get difficult. So finally, I got my 45 shoe size. Unfortunately, it was a lady shoes. 
It was not only lady shoes, it was lady sandals in the 60s, which was just a piece of leather, you know, with wide, long strings to it. You could tie around you <laughs> up to the knee. This was kind of fashion. I don't know if you remember it in the 60s, it was like this. So I was wearing the hands at the time. I completely demolished my feet because it was just a thin piece of leather with no isolation in the street. It was like walking bare feet, basically. So my feet completely cracked up and fell apart. But anyway, it's a long story story. Same thing about eating. No buying burger. We are monks. So every evening we stop 6 o'clock and we went door to door begging burger. You know, ringing on people's doors, we are monks, we are hungry. Could you give us something to eat? From 6 to 7, I remember, it was always the time we used to do on traveling. That went completely out of control. Why? Because people gave us so much. So we became a total hedonist, you know. We had, oh, we had cream all over the place, and we had just, you know, we were bringing bags, you know, to the van, you know, <laughs> and all like this. So, <laughs> because, you know, when they give you something, you have no choice to say no, really, to many things. So, you know, they were emptying out the fridges, you know. And we, of course, told them we are vegetarian and all this, you know, but still, we had so much more, like, you know, the whole cars full of this. And then we can throw it out. Well, how, do you, how do you actually use boba? You, how do you, so it doesn't go bad. We have no refrigerator in the car. Well, it's very simple. You just eat it all. That's all. It's the best way to store boba. So we were just, we had a, until 10 o'clock in the evening, we had friends, you know. We <laughs> were just eating like mad. So that was stopped too. So, <laughs> you know, but to speak of some highly unbonified items which came along with that. <laughs> Cakes, you know, and we, all, we ask, are there eggs inside? No, no. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and then we just learn to discriminate which cake is better and this and that. And, you know, and we had sometimes, you know, 10 cakes before we went to sleep in the evening for Brahmacha. <laughs> so, things like this. So that went out of control. But the point is that these devotees had faith. Absolute faith. Where do you find it? Now this is everybody, you know, a little bit for Krishna, a little bit for me, you know. And it slows, of course, the whole process immensely down. Can you do it? Was it because the movement grew? Because Prabhupada was still here, right? Yes. So was it because just more devotees came and Prabhupada couldn't really... That was, uh, we could say, we can be really plainly credited to Prabhupada's presence. And also, of course, this, I mean, if you want to go further, you can see the material circumstances are also a little bit different. If you have a choice to go to Vietnam or become Hare Krishna and do chant Hare Krishna on the street, what do you want to do? You know, the moment Prabhupada became established as the minister of religion and his movement was the official religious movement in America, means you are a monk, you don't go to war. So many jobs. In the beginning, Prabhupada had a problem with his draft, you know, people always got drafted to the army. And they were handling it quite successfully. There were only a few devotees who actually ended up in Vietnam. And uh, Prabhupada was very keen on that, we find it in the letters. Because there was one devotee, he got a letter, it was not coordinated by the government. So he was drafted somewhere in Utah or Oklahoma. And he was excused because he was Hare Krishna, you know, a monk. It was a letter. Prabhupada said, I want that letter to me. Should be duplicated. And said, all over the Americas, <laughs> you can show what this anyway devotee being drafted can show. But come on, in Oklahoma they don't send people to Vietnam. How comes it actually in the state of New York I have to go? What is this? And then it became more and more clear that when you're high, you say, no, you don't go to Vietnam. That was one of these things. And then all this hippie mood was carrying so many aspects already of renunciation, revolution, opposition, questioning of any given values. Whatever was established as important, well, that's exactly what we you know what we call it establishment. You know, it's fun to you know mock anything which was given by the government, anything, on main principle, good or bad, doesn't matter. So that was the mood that Prabhupada brought from all of them, certainly, but above all, it was his personality.
is personal, with care. This is what can add very simple. Even the words have been so for half a year, one year. The relationship was so intense. Anything you do did, and anything you anything, all your activities were certainly controlled by Prabhupada. Every minute of the day you said, what about Prabhupada? What did you say about that? And what this and what that? And Prabhupada built this movement on pillars of senior devotees. All the young devotees, when they join, they automatically, they actually surrendered to the senior devotees in the same way they surrendered to Prabhupada. Even there was a difference, yeah. <laughs> My first GBC really liked guns. <laughs> he liked guns. <laughs> and he was very, you know, but again, every word was Prabhupada. Prabhupada said, Prabhupada did. Prabhupada, Prabhupada, Prabhupada. And, and that Prabhupada's presence was so, you know, can be felt in every kirtan, in everything. And that united, of course, everything. Even though there are so many problems amongst devotees, more as today, because there were more devotees. <laughs> you know, there were so many conflicts and so many things. But once Prabhupada, okay, Prabhupada, that's it. There was no discussion on this point. The Kirtans were just loaded with this Prabhupada spirit. You know? No, this is not me and Krishna. It was not my Krishna. It was so clear that, yeah, Krishna is nice, but without Prabhupada, it's just there's no way to, to, to start to comprehend who is actually Krishna. Because every information about Krishna and every thing that we knew came from now. We didn't know it. Hmm. It seems also that the uh, time it was more simple, just in general. People were just like more simple than now. Yeah. Yeah. No. In that regard, not much change. Who said that much hedonism and that much speculation flying around? You think these hippies were simple in the head? They had so oh, they had ideas. You can see those in Prabhupada letters. Prabhupada always tried to respect that speculation, not to discourage him, but transfer it into Krishna consciousness. You know? People had ideas, even after initiation, when the words were carrying in their heads. And it was all drug inspired, you know. It's all this LSD and you know, all these things. And I mean, I go to a good seminar in Denmark, what hashish can do to you, but LSD is something really of another. Any synthetic drug is uh, of another nature, you know. This is permanent damages for life. You are really finished. I remember even my wonderful godbrothers years, years later going on Harinam in Berlin or something like this, and he told me, you know, when I chant, sometimes these crosses on the churches, they start to sparkle, and ch -ch -ch, they shine. You know, this is all still as these are spinning around. It's a heavy, heavy, heavy stuff, you know. It's just tearing your subtle body really apart. It's like being invalid with a physical body that we can understand. He cannot walk. But there is also LSD damage created which he cannot think in a certain way or it inspires emotions and, and visions which are just like a pictures, you know, who reflect back and forth. And then that makes also quite some trouble, you know. So if I understood, I never go to that. So if I never took this stuff, I was so scared. <laughs> Krishna saved me because they were also offering me these sort of mysterious white cubes and you know packaged in silver paper. It was full, full. Everybody had something like this those days. Hey, you want to have tonight here? Just you know, you know, let's see what it does to you. Far out. <laughs> and I said, dear boy, do you know what it does to you? No, but let's try it out. They said, well, that's exactly what I will not try it out because I don't know what it will do to me. It was scary. You know. These people were so bold, they were just throwing in anything what they found on the street. So this is the stuff Prabhupada made the movement. So naturally it was not simple. 
That's just purely spiritual power. How Prabhupada penetrated all that conditioning and brought these people more and more on the line of devotional service to engage. Well, there are so many, so many letters in this regard. I don't like to call this Grihasta Ashram because it looks like I have some power in some Grihastas and I need it really. But also those Krihastas was practically like Brahmacharya, wasn't it? Brahmacharya is... They lived like sannyasis. What? Sorry? They lived like sannyasis. Mm. <laughs> it was not hard for them. Mm. And garden and, you know, and they had a little dog in front of the door, not a dog. Well, living from banana boxes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 And Prabhupada, we have to say quite frankly, he didn't consider much the dimension of Western Grihastha Ashrama, what they actually expect this to be. He sort of more in Indian terms. Because in India, the whole family is in one room. You know, no problem. Somehow you can feel it, Prabhupada was not, you know, uh, but he was respecting, you know, Grihastha's uh, Vaisha type, making business, and, you know, and he, he sort of, there's really a problem, I said, he writes, Grihastha needs a place to live. Or a flat. He didn't make any difference. In India they call a flat a house even, maybe you know this. Mm. You know. I remember once I was that's a long story how I came across a family in the Grand Canaria in you know, in Spain. Year after year I end up. And it's a long story how we had a, another branch of Hare Krishna Center Stockholm was actually in Grand Canaria in Spain. Anyway, so, and there was an Indian, Indians are everywhere. So we came across Indians who were very fired up. And they said, why are you always renting house here? You can stay in my house. I was going, whoa, for hold. No, it was an old little dirty flat in Gran Canaria. You know? <laughs> they call it the house. In India it's like that, flat is called house. So Prabhupada didn't make actually a difference. And uh, he said, he has to have a place to live. He has to cook something and eat. And basically he invites always some guests, so that's pretty easy. You cook some prasada, you turn your place where you live, you make some program. It's, Prabhupada didn't call it congregational and all this foul stuff and all this. You hear the congregational network around the temple and all this. Prabhupada, this was, this was a temple. You have a place where you have worship in Krishna and it's a temple. That's it. And you invite guests and encourage them to do the same. It's called Bhakta program. <laughs> and what is more comfortable is to visit somebody, you know, a family, and the wife cooks something, and you have a nice meal, and they all chant in Hare Krishna, happy here, and they live out there. That's called the temple. I live by this two and a half years and get a book. I have to say, I have only good memories. <laughs> We had school programs in the living room, three, three school programs a day. <laughs> because there was quite a big house, the living room was the size of this temple room. But uh, we had three school programs a day. That was my very last Yeah. Maybe we should try and huh? Maybe we should try and it. And I tell you, they love it. Schools come and they, they came, they were thinking we go to the Hindu temple or whatever. They end up in a big bungalow in front of Gatebog. It was even outside of the city. In the living area, you know. There was these buses coming up and the neighbors were going, on. what is this, you know? And then another bus in front of the door, you know. And there was these thousands and hundreds of kids. I mean, we had, can you imagine, there's 120 kids a day, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and then they were putting in the door, and the next class, and next class. And we had a foul schedule, you know. We got up in the morning, had a very short program like in Santita, then we cooked up some prasadam again. Then the school program started. In a basement I had a bhakta who was broadcasting radio, we had a local radio station. You know, yeah. Uh, Urushavadas was broadcasting radio. We had a box standing there in a, in a, in a you know, like soundproof studio. And he was broadcasting radio and they came in and they said, we oh, have a radio station, that's amazing. There was no internet those days. And then they came up and there was the living room, you know, uh, and then we had a school program. One after another, then that was finished, took a little rest, and four o'clock in the afternoon, we went out, both me and my wife, collecting uh, with paintings. 
until 10 o'clock in the evening, sometimes midnight. That was going on for two and a half years non-stop. We had a pretty good economy. On top of that, we had a Brahmachari party still attached to it, who were doing books just in the city of Gedeborg. That's 250,000 people. They never went on traveling. They had a car, but they just did the city. I mean, they were just bombed the whole city for two and a half years. You know. Two and a half, two hundred fifty thousand, it's not so much. But I just at the end, door to door, just mushing it all up. <laughs> you know. <laughs> but they didn't collect really. The economic percentage, they just collect for the leasing of the car. And we had a bombastic prasad, I remember, you can't imagine. Because this Brahmacharis, we had few Brahmacharis, we had like five, six Brahmacharis. Yeshadulau and company, they were eating like hell, you know. <laughs> By the way, in the morning, you know, avocado with cream, you know. And, you know, it was like, oh, you know. I was the bread maker, I made breads of this size, you know, like huge breads. And uh, actually, I have only good advice on this. So, but there was no children. Children change everything. Because then whoosh, they, they absorb so much energy. It's natural. It's natural. It's not so much that, it's just that what happens. So they lift like that. You have no time for some big romantics or something. It's not romantics. It's really fun to preach with your wife together. That's what I call romantic. That's really romantic. Because she can smash out any other thing, another thing. And I just made a fire a few days ago, you know, uh, which my wife made, preaching fire for herself with her many quotes in it. So, something like this, I was expected. Uh, yeah. But, you know, I could say something more in this direction, but I won't. But, uh, Prabhupada said that. But still, let's face it. Nothing ever in the terms of book distribution could compensate the Ramadan party, which was plain, straight out army of brahmacharis headed by Tamal Krishna Maharaj. With the silver greyhound buses. Never ever in the history of Iskon that many books went out and that many doctors joined. That you find also in Prabhupada letters to some degree. But it's, it's logical and clear that Prabhupada had to count a little bit more the Gayasas as the Brahmacharya. <laughs> because you know, it's more intricate fields, but he was most, <coughs> most encouraging. Especially one Mataji called Govinda and he said, She got so much mercy. <laughs> Govinda Devadasa letters is it's it's amazing. Shri Prabhupada had, had no even fear she gets puffed up. He writes in my dear heroine Govinda Devinaj. Wow. He never wrote me such a <laughs> She was obviously a fierce preacher. There was one famous public meeting where she got up and smashed on everywhere with Mayavada singing. Everybody like this, exposing the Mayavada which was going on. How about love that? <laughs> Especially these American ladies, you know, they are very, <clears throat> you know, they come from somewhere from Texas, from the farm, you know. They know how to ride horse and shoot, you know, from the horse to, you know. So then you became bhakti like this, what do you expect is going to change? And so, so like this. <laughs> they were all just, you know, just, okay, next one, you know. <laughs> that was this style, American style. Yeah. yeah. I was just wondering about this. Uh, sometimes we're talking about that devotees are not like uh, there's not the same uh, amount of surrender or this mm -hmm. kind of just 